So X-rays are fundamentally created when an energetic electron leaves the cathode and collides with a metal target that is the anode. And when this happens, there are two types of radiation produced, characteristic and bremsstrahlung radiation. Bit of a tongue twister, that one. Understanding the relevance between these two types is essential as they're relevant in a wide range of scientific fields, including material science, radiotherapy, and of course, medical imaging. And so by the end of this video, you'll know all about characteristic and bremsstrahlung radiation, what their key differences are, and why you should even care. In a nutshell, characteristic Characteristic radiation gets its name from the fact that the energy produced is constant and predictable, depending of course on the anode material within the x-ray tube target, that is what specific element it's made of, which could be for example tungsten. Whereas Bremsstrahlung radiation gets its name from the German word that literally translates to breaking radiation or decelerating radiation. Now before we get into these two ideas, it's important to understand a little bit about the atom. In any atom, the atomic number refers to the number of protons in its nucleus, which if it's a stable atom, meaning it's not an ion, it also equals the total number of electrons surrounding it. We can calculate the maximum number of electrons in each cell of an atom using this nifty little formula, 2n squared, where n is the shell number. So in the first shell, it'd be 2 times 1 squared, which is 2. The second shell would be 2 times 2 squared, which is 8. And the third shell will be 2 times 3 squared, which is 18, and so on. And this will keep on going until you account for all electrons. Another important point is that these electron shells have names. The first shell is the k shell, then the l shell, and M shell, and so on down the alphabet. I'm sure there's a good reason why it starts with K, but for now it's not too important, just remember it. And the way that I do is I think of the word OK, where the nucleus is the O and the first shell is the K. All right, now that we got that out of the way, let's start from the top with characteristic radiation. So characteristic radiation is produced when an electron that is released from the cathode collides with an inner K shell electron of an atom in the anode, causing an ionization event to take place and thereby removing an electron from its orbiting shell. Let's take this atom to be tungsten, for example, which has a symbol of W and an atomic number of 74, meaning it's got 74 protons in its nucleus and 74 electrons whizzing around. If an electron was to come in and interact with this atom, it would come in and knock off a K-shell electron from its orbiting shell. Now this puts the atom in an unstable state which cannot continue for long, so the very next thing that happens is that it wants to fill in that gap with an electron in the next shell, that is, from the L shell. But hold on, now the L shell has a vacancy, so that also immediately gets filled in by the next outer shell, this time from the M shell, and so on. Now each shell has a different binding energy, and when each electron moves from one shell to another, they release the energy difference in the form of characteristic radiation. If we're looking at our tungsten atom from earlier, we can see that the K-shell has a binding energy of about 69.5 kiloelectron volts, the L-shell has about 11.5 kiloelectron volts, and the M-shell has about 2.5 kiloelectron volts. So when an ionizing event takes place, and there is a vacancy in the inner K-shell, an electron from the L-shell moves into the K-shell orbit, where there's a difference in binding energy of about 58 keV, which is just 69.5 minus 11.5. Now this 58 keV of energy is released in the form of an X-ray, but sometimes you may get an electron from the M shell moving down into the K shell. If we do the math, we see that the difference in binding energy between the M and the K shells is about 67 keV. That is 69.5 minus 2.5. This 67 keV also gets released in the form of an X-ray. Now because the binding energies in our tungsten atom always have the same value, the X-ray energy released from the L to the K shell or from the M to the K shell is always constant. And this is what these two vertical spikes or discrete energy peaks are in this graph which demonstrates the various characteristic X-rays produced. But hold on, you may be asking what about the M to L shell transition you mentioned earlier? Or better yet, what about the N to L shell transition? Well, it all comes down to how much energy is released, that is the energy difference between the shells. And whether that would even show up or be relevant. The M to L shell transition would only create a very small amount of energy. Can you calculate how much? So pause the video for a second to figure it out. I'll wait. All right, time's up. It'll be the difference in binding energy between the two shells. That is 11 minus two and a half, equating to nine kilo electron volts, which is very small. Note also that for any of this characteristic radiation to occur, the electron requires at least 69.5 keV of energy to remove the K-shell electron. And if it's less than the binding energy, say if we set a KVP of 50, 
then it doesn't have sufficient energy to result in the K ejection. Remember that these binding energies are unique to tungsten and will be different depending on the target or anode material. So instead of tungsten, if it's molybdenum or rhodium, for example, both are pretty common anode materials, the energy release will be different and therefore the characteristic radiation energy will also be different. Hopefully you're still with me. It does get quite complicated, but now let's move on to bremsstrahlung radiation. First of all, pronouncing it is a challenge unto itself, but spelling it is also a pain. So what I do is just break it down into three words, brems, stra, and lung. So remember earlier when I said that the words bremsstrahlung radiation directly translates from German to breaking radiation or decelerating radiation? Well, let's explore that a little bit further as it'll help us to understand what's going on on the atomic scale. Instead of an electron coming in from the cathode and hitting an electron in an atom in the anode, as we saw with characteristic radiation, this time it interacts with the nucleus. Now it's not that high of an energy to fully collide or even break the nucleus apart, but the electron does pass by closely and what happens to it as it passes by determines the energy of the X-rays released. Now we know that the nucleus is a positive force. It's packed full of protons. So when a negative incident electron comes and passes by the nucleus, the opposing charges causes a momentary attraction, which either causes a distinct interaction where the electron gets slightly deflected. There could be a close interaction where the the electron gets moderately deflected, say about 90 degrees, or the electron could impact the nucleus in which it gets completely deflected back at an acute angle. And so the level of direction change will determine the energy of the X-rays produced. Where the distant interaction produces relatively low energy X-rays, the close interaction produces medium level energy X-rays, and the interaction that impacts the nucleus results in the production of relatively high energy X-rays and everything in between. And collectively, we call this release of X-rays with a wide range of energy levels, bremsstrahlung radiation. Again, this all occurs when the kinetic energy of the electron which is the amount of energy it has by virtue of being in motion, is lost as it interacts with the nucleus and changes direction. Because the amount of energy released is proportional to the level of direction change. And because there can be a large range of these directional changes that occur, this results in the continuous spectrum of energies that we see in the graph. So in summary, the difference between these two types of radiation is in their intensity. Bremsstrahlung radiation is typically more intense than characteristic radiation, as it's produced whenever an electron is decelerated, regardless of the material, whereas characteristic radiation is only produced when an electron interacts with an atom and knocks off a K-shell electron, meaning it's dependent upon the atomic structure of the target or anode material. Because the energy of the emitted photons in characteristic radiation is fixed, it's relatively easy to filter out unwanted radiation. However, with bremsstrahlung radiation, since it has a continuous spectrum, it can be more difficult to filter out unwanted radiation and can lead to overexposure. In practice, there is inherent filtration present just by the nature of how the X-ray tube is constructed. For example, the glass envelope, the oil that the tube is enhoused in, the light beam diaphragm that the beam passes through, etc. All of which removes about 50% of the X-rays generated. But then we usually have additional filtration, such as with certain thicknesses of aluminium, that removes the remaining remaining 80% of the unwanted low energy and soft x-rays. And just a final point on this, note that the mechanism of these two x-ray production means that there's a range of energies that exists just above zero to close to the KVP set for a given exposure. And since the KVP determines the maximum energy an incoming electron can have, this in turn will determine the maximum energy that can be lost during bremsstrahlung radiation and therefore the maximum energy of the X-rays released in this process. All right, that's it for now and well done for sticking to the end. You now know a lot more about these two types of radiation than you did 10 minutes ago. These concepts tie in very closely to the main types of radiation used in medical imaging, which I've made a comprehensive video about. So I really encourage you to click here to watch that to get a more fuller understanding of the topic. All right, see you in the next video. Stay curious.